So I want to talk about the writing process again before we dive into our They Say, I Say content for the day. Um, we're thinking about that, plan that, that idea of planning. Um, because, you, you know, I talk about the writing process as though they say, you know, pro writing process, week one, planning. But you could be in like week two or three of your writing process and find yourself jumping backwards to again be engaged in planning rather than shaping or drafting uh, simply because you might have run yourself into a corner with an idea or in the case of what we're doing with the synthesis, uh, you've come across another source. Um, but if we think to, if we think about the idea of gathering ideas and determining focus, um, the process of writing the synthesis paper is a little bit like what we should be doing in our heads in the future when we're amassing our sources. We're going to the library or checking in the library database and we're getting our sources. And so we've got all this information and we're reading it and we're rereading it and we're annotating it and we're carefully uh, collating this information. We're bringing it into our heads trying to understand it, trying to absorb it so that we can demonstrate mastery of that content later on. And we should be bringing these voices into what we talked about last week, synthesis with each other. So if you're in the Hiroshima strain, the, um, the, the formula is Alperovitz plus Asada equals what? Right? We talked about this last week. What do you get when you put Alperovitz and Asada together? Well, you get a cage match. You get a fight. You get a disagreement. Because Alperovitz says uh, you know, that um, America didn't need to drop the bomb. And Asada just stops short of saying, no, they absolutely needed to. Right? Um, so he, you know, and, and he's a Japanese scholar. This is a Japanese scholar saying the Japanese military was so entrenched they were so committed to carrying out the rest of the Pacific War uh, that they, you know, pushed America to drop the bomb on them. Not once, but twice, right? They were still vacillating after the dropping of the Hiroshima bomb. And they were still ready to fight after the Nagasaki one. So we put Alperovitz and Asada together and we get a disagreement, and you have to decide as a writer which of those arguments you think is the stronger. And th that's, you know, you're going to come up with some form of uh, uh, thesis from that, right? Uh, in the Godzilla side, we put Rifle and Tsutsui together. And what do we get there? Ah, we get agreement. We get two guys probably going for drinks and nerding out about Gojira, right? Uh, now, Tsutsui talks about the whole Godzilla franchise, but he has a lengthy section of his article that is devoted to that first film. So in the process of gathering ideas and determining our own focus, we need to be aware of what other writers' uh, focuses are. What, what's their thesis statement? And then we bring those thesis statements together. And the other thing that we can note about this process is that if you're writing a research paper and you've brought two sources together and they're on the same topic, but they aren't having the same conversation, it might be really difficult to use that source for your paper. But it brings us to chapter four of They Say, I Say, three ways to respond. And it's funny, you know, you come away from this chapter going, well, duh, of course there's three ways to respond. Yes, no, and okay, but. Although that last one is a little contentious. Um, but I think that uh, we don't really think through those three positions relative to the sources that we're reading for our courses, relative to the information that we're getting from the articles and whatnot that we are reading for our research. So Graf and Birkenstein say that the most interesting interpretations tend to be those that, that agree, disagree, or both. And they're saying this in response to the idea that many students seem to have that what they need to do is just put a bunch of information that no one's really going to disagree with, uh, you know, just have sort of like things we already know in some ways. And, and that's not the best academic writing. Now, on the flip side of that, it doesn't mean that you need to be going and looking for the most batshit idea that you possibly can find and then trying to defend that. Uh, university isn't about always creating a Frankenstein monster out of, you know, spare body parts every time you write a research essay. It doesn't have to be a total bolt out of the blue, okay? Uh, because in many of your classes, your profs understand that you're still in the learning phase of your discipline. 
So they're not expecting you to like take a leap beyond, you know, in psychology, some, some great thinker in terms of behavioral psychology, like chick sent me high. They're not expecting you to go jumping out in front of that person. They are expecting you to be able to say what chick sent me high said and to comment on it in some way. I don't expect you guys to tell me something I've never heard before about Godzilla or Hiroshima. I mean, I've been teaching this for years and I have had some students surprise me along the way, but it's not an expectation that I have. So please, please, please don't think that just because, you know, you shouldn't be doing this milk toast, uh, completely lacking in controversy type of writing that you should then flip the pendulum all the way, swing the pendulum all the, the way to the other side and just go for the wackiest, wildest stuff that you can possibly come up with. Okay. So, the most interesting interpretations tend to be those that agree, disagree, or both. And that both part, there's a lot of students coming out of high school who go, wait a second, I wasn't allowed to do that. We'll get there. That instead of being offered solo, the best interpretations take strong stands relative to other interpretations. So, again, this comes back to the idea of the conversation, of us being in conversation with these texts, being in conversation with these voices, with these thinkers, and having some form of response to what they say, right? So, the three responses, very basic, yes, no, and finally, okay, but, and, and what do we mean by these responses? When you read each article this semester, did you agree with them? Did you disagree with them? Or did you have some mix thereof? Was it yes? Was it no? Or okay, but, you know, and just as importantly, coming off of having done your summary of Alperovitz or Rifle, especially for the Hiroshima track, you know, did you swallow Alperovitz's lines, hook, line, and sinker? His ideas, hook, line, and sinker? So that you were like, yes, Alperovitz, yes, those, those terrible Americans. And then you got to Asada and you went, ah. And were you going, no, Asada, you're wrong because Alperovitz told me and you're wrong, right? And as you're developing your synthesis, thinking about how our, you know, article voices respond to each other. Who says yes? Who says no? Who says okay, but? Does anybody say okay, but? Uh, and there's this classic bit of British comedy from Monty Python called uh, The Argument Clinic. And in this sketch, this guy goes to this place and he says he'd like to buy an argument. And then he goes into a room with the guy who played Nearly Headless Nick in the Harry Potter series, and uh, they have an argument. Um, what it finally devolves into, and I highly recommend that you take just a few moments. In fact, you should pause this right now, and I'm going to put the link for this video into um, you know the, the notes just beneath this. If you're watching this on YouTube, you should stop, and you should just go, and you should watch it right now. And, it, and all, everything I'm going to say after this is going to just be... It might not make more sense sense because I think I'm going to explain it relatively well, but at least you'll get a laugh before you arrive there. I would normally have shown this to my students, but I'm on YouTube and so copyright, I can't, I can't, I can't. Um, and if you're listening to the podcast, take some time. Monty Python, argument. That's all you'd need to Google and, and you'd get this. Um, but this, this ostensible argument devolves into just a shouting back and forth of, no, you didn't. Yes, I did. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. Um, and, and finally, one of them saying, you know, this isn't an argument. And, and the other guy says, yes, it is. <laughs> no, it isn't. Um, but before they arrive at that moment, he walks into the wrong room. The guy who wants to buy an argument, walks into the wrong room, and he, this guy yells at him and just calls him a bunch of names, and, a, and, and, and he says, I came here for an argument. And the guy says, oh, this is abuse. You want, you know, just a little ways down the road. But I love that as the first door that this guy who wants an argument gets. Because quite often I think we have confused criticism, critical thinking. You hear that a lot in university. We want you to be critical thinkers. Uh, in English, we teach our students to be critical thinkers. I don't know why I talk like that. I don't have any colleagues with that accent. But we say that, right? Critical thinking is what we want from our students. 
And, um, and my students seem to think that what we mean by critical thinking is abuse. That you just, you're going to be critical immediately and you're going to be critical and like an angry and like, you know, this person's a terrible racist or something like that. Just jumping right there, right away before working your way through the argument. That, and, 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 and name calling and abuse, that's the, that's the argument, argumentative norm of the world outside the university. Uh, a lot of political debates have devolved in the last 10 years into name calling contests. It's just mudslinging back and forth across the lines. And I'm not saying all political uh, parties, all political entities, but we've had our fair share of it. And you've got to understand this. Criticism is not necessarily the same as critical thinking. In the same way that having an argument on a, on a research paper isn't the same as just saying no to everything that the other person has said. And so, again, coming back to this, no, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. And the guy says, wait a second, this isn't an argument. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. And he says, an argument is a connected series of statements intended to establish a proposition, a connected series of statements intended to establish a proposition. Now, as you're writing your synthesis papers right now, and you're going to be writing your research papers later in the semester, I want you to think about the way that you have been going about putting that together. Now, some of you already know this. Some of you know, I, if I start with somebody saying this one thing, then the next thing has to relate to that. It has to be a response to it. It has to be a continuation. It has to be an, an exploration of wherever things just were. It can't just be no and then you move on, okay? Um, because an argument isn't just, as the, the sketch says, uh, you know, it's not just contradiction. He says an argument is an intellectual process. Contradiction is just the automatic gainsaying, or as they say, I say would put it, naysaying of anything the other person says. And, and I've told you guys this before, but this bears repeating because I, I want to I weed this out of your intellectual gardens. Just saying no to everything the prof says isn't critical thinking. It isn't a strong argument. Being the naysayer is actually, you know, and that's not to say that we should never say no to things, but if your default is, no, no, I disagree with that. And you know why I disagree with that? quite often you're just trying to be the smartest person in the room and constantly saying no in interestingly is this that's what we did when we were three when we were establishing our own identities no 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 i do it myself that sort of thing and that's you sound like the academic equivalent of that if that's all you ever do in class because like, really you disagreed with everything your prof brought to the table, that's bananas. And pro tip, it's also just a bad idea. Like to just be constantly disagreeing with your prof, your prof's not impressed. Your prof's like, geez, I did all this work to bring, you know, I assigned these books or, I, you know, this is the stuff that we're looking at. And this person's just, you know, you're just shitting on their lawn constantly and don't do it. Okay. That's my pro tip. Um, fake it till you make it. Right? Say yes every now and again, even if you constantly disagree. Um, just to practice, just to see what it feels like. Uh, but really, if you're in a class and all you say is no to all of the great ideas that your prof, who's an expert in that field, who has brought other experts to the table, has said, you know, and I, and I, and I, I had a student uh, a couple of years ago and they were like, well, you know, suspicion of authority and all this sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, that's good. Yeah, we should question authority every now and again. But if all you do is question authority, that's a default setting. And ultimately, it's not argument. It's just contradiction. And I don't really think it 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 doesn't demonstrate the kind of intellectual prowess that you're going for. OK, so. We want to do more than just say no. We want to say no, and we want to explain why we disagree. As they say, I say says, you need to do more than simply assert that you disagree with a particular view. Such a response merely contradicts the view it responds to and fails to add anything new. Imagine a sada just saying, no, Pavitz is wrong. And you're like, do you have, do you have any evidence for that? Because Pavitz has got a stack 
He's got a whole bunch of stuff in it. I got, I got to tell you, it's pretty convincing. And Saad is like, no, I'm not going to tell you. He's just wrong. You'd be like, mm, pfft, I don't buy what you, you're selling, man. But Asada disagrees with El Paravitz. Not necessarily directly. It's not like Asada's like, I disagree with El Paravitz. He's, but his argument does. His thesis disagrees with El Paravitz. And he brings a lot that's new, right? He's not just contradicting El Paravitz. He's bringing a lot new to the table. And he goes to some pains to ensure that we understand that what he's bringing is new, right? Um, that there's this revisiting, this reassessment, that we're looking at this one more time. We're looking at this one more time to really understand what's going on. And he says, hey, you, you know why we didn't come to this conclusion sooner? Because this information wasn't, wasn't available. And then he also says, and there are some problems with some of this information. However, this still indicates a lot of, you know, what I'm, what I'm saying here. This indicates a lot of what I, what I think. So Al, Alperovitz and, 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 and Asada disagree. But Asada's disagreement of Alperovitz explains why he disagrees. Well, Alperovitz explains why he disagreed with scholars who preceded him. That's good academic disagreement. No, and here's why. We've got some templates in our book. By focusing on blank, X overlooks the deeper problem of blank, right? Um, and, you know, you might not necessarily use that one with what we're currently looking at, but this is a, I think a really, uh, it's, it's a good way of learning how to disagree in an academic way. But, because we don't just, again, we don't just disagree. We, we demonstrate why we disagree. And then we add something to the conversation. And then the other position, yes. But yes can be the same sort of thing as the contradiction. You go back to the Monty Python sketch and you've got the one guy going, no, it isn't. And the other one going, yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. And it's just this boop, 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 boop. It's like watching like intellectual pong. And, which is an ancient video game for those of you who don't know. So yes can, is just really the flip side of no. It's the inverse of that. So we need... You know, if, if if we say yes, we need to agree and explain why with a difference, right? We don't just we don't just say the same thing that they've said. But we're basically taking that idea of no plus persuasive reasons why you disagree and saying yes plus plus persuasive reasons why you agree. And it can't just be because he had a good idea. Because we need to be agreeing with a difference, right? As as the as our textbook says, be more than just an echo or a parrot. Like, Tsutsui agrees with Rifle. Does he say the exact same things that Rifle does? No. He has a whole bunch of other stuff that he says. And he says, this is, is the interesting thing about Tsutsui's article, he says he's going to talk about the entire series of Godzilla movies. But he mostly focuses on that 1954 film. So don't be fooled by what he told you his thesis was because he mostly talks about the 54 film and there are a few things that he says along the way that are like really illuminating in 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 a sense that you know that rifle doesn't talk about rifle doesn't talk about how um you know the the japanese military wasn't allowed to you know fight other countries and so they weren't allowed to make and they were also not allowed to make movies where they demonstrate, well, where they showed that, where they showed the Japanese military attacking other countries. Well, you know, how are we ever going to get our, when do we get to see our military fight anything? Anytime Godzilla or Mothra or, you know, King Ghidorah rolls up on your, your, your shores, you get to bring out planes and tanks and lasers and masers and you can show that stuff. Um, and in a way, Gojira, the original the original Godzilla, does that. And Tsutsui also has, I, I think, some really cool uh, tidbits. If we're, you know, if we're taking what Rifle has said, you know, this is a very serious film, this is a metaphor for uh, the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima. Um, it's too bad Rifle didn't know what Tsutsui does about the original audiences leaving the theater in tears. That's a goldmine. 
If I was writing my synthesis about Godzilla, you'd darn tootin' I'd be putting that in there. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, say no more. Uh, another Monty Python reference there. Uh, you know, we've got templates for this too. So they say, I say, provides us not only with, you know, our responses, no and yes, but templates where we can learn how to agree in an academic paper. So again, I, I can't stress this. I know that a number of you are like, I'm, a ma I'm an amazing writer already, Dr. Prashan. You can't teach me anything and neither can this graph or Birkenstein. Um, take the time to just try them out. You know, take, take them for a drive. I agree that blank, a point that needs emphasizing since so many people believe blank. I agree that blank a point that needs emphasizing since so many people believe, still believe blank. This is one of the things that, that it says about, like, you know, if we agree, we may be, uh, you know, expanding on something that, that, you know, changes the way that we think about it. We can agree with somebody um, and potentially be changing, you know, the, the way that, that we're approaching that argument. And then finally, we've got the third position, which is okay, but... And this is the one where students go, mm, you know, my teachers told me in high school that I had to have a position. So it was yes or it was no. But you couldn't say okay, but. And I'm telling you right now, you can say okay, but. In fact, not only can you say okay, but, but I think that saying okay, but is better than just saying yes or just saying no. And I think about this not just as a prof, not just as someone who, you know, is teaching my students how to write, but is really deeply invested in seeing our world outside of the university improve. We are so polarized in North America right now. I mean, the States has got it bad. Polarization, left, right. Nothing in between. No one's crossing the floor in their, you know, in their, uh, in their government to agree with each other. It's just, you know, these drawing up these battle lines. And you're over there and we're over here. And we just, we're not going to have a conversation. I see the same thing happening in Canada. I see the same thing happening in Canada about so many things. Intense polarization. Very little okay but going on. Uh, and we need, we, we need, I think, that... We, we need to be able to say, okay, but for a number of reasons. Um, but with your writing in this course, the reason that we want to go with, okay, but potentially is because uh, it is ultimately, I think, and Graf and Birkenstein think, um, the most sophisticated of the three positions. So just say yes or just say no, right? You know, like somebody might say, I think, I think Godzilla sucks. Does it? It just sucks. It outright sucks. There's nothing good about it. I see this all the time with, with people in movies. Like, I hated whatever the movie was. It was terrible. Was it? Was the whole movie terrible? The soundtrack sucked. The cinematography was terrible. The editing was shit. Everything about it was garbage. Or you just didn't like the plot. Or you didn't like one of the actors. Or it didn't live up to your expectations. Like, what was it? Was it actually that it stunk? Or was it one of these other things? We just don't have that kind of nuance in conversations. It's black, it's white, it's yes, it's no. And certainly some of my students have worried that by expressing ambivalence, they will come across as evasive, wishy-washy, or unsure. And if you end your paper, if you go, here's what Asada says, and here's what Alperovitz says, and you choose... It's not a choose your own adventure, okay? That's not what this synthesis is about. You don't give all the information on one side and then give a bunch of other information on the other side then come to the end and go like, well, what do you think? I don't know. Because that is evasive, wishy-washy, and unsure. But to say that Godzilla, while it is an extremely dated movie, and for a modern viewer, it's kind of hard to watch because it's slow moving. Um, but it, you know, still has this resonance of this dark, almost documentary style film is an okay but response. To rather than saying like Alperovitz is completely wrong or Alperovitz is right, he's the man, or some reverse of that, you can say, 
what we recognize from the conversation between Asada and Alperovitz is that placing blame for the Hiroshima event, for the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima, is not as clean cut as saying it was absolutely just America's fault and it was, or it was absolutely just Japan's fault. There seems to be complicity on both sides of the Pacific. That's the sort of response that says, okay, but, right? And so ultimately, I think an okay, but response is the best response. So we can say, we can say in an okay, but response, we can have more yes than no, or more no than yes to certain positions, to certain voices inside the greater argument. Um, but that's, that's still not that polarization of just yes or just no. It's this, this okay, but response. Uh, some of the, uh, the templates for this, although I agree with X up to a point, I cannot accept his overall conclusion that blank, right? Um, although I disagree with much that X says, here's no, right? That first one was yes, although I agree with, that's a yes, I cannot accept, that's a little bit of no, that's okay, but although I disagree with much that X says, no, I fully endorse his conclusion that, yes. So it's a mixture. And rather than being ambivalent or wishy-washy or any of those sorts of things, there is a sense in which that I would argue that having this blend of yes and no's is a far more sophisticated response. And I ultimately think that just like with summary, it also demonstrates a greater mastery of the material. Because I think that in most arguments, it's pretty easy to do the, here's, here's the one side of the argument and to completely defeat it. I mean, to some degree, that's, that's what you learn in debate club is how to completely defeat the opposition. Whereas in my experience, the okay but position is more sophisticated and it will ultimately not, like yes or no could win the argument, but okay but wins over your opponent. Being able to say, I can see where you're coming from, but is better than just going, no, no, absolutely not, that's stupid. Right? It just shuts everything down, the conversation's over. Okay but says, Let's keep talking. Let's keep having this conversation. And in a way, it's, 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 the, it's the ultimate they say, I say. Because it's incorporating what they say into what I say. Finding some middle ground. That doesn't mean complete, like, yeah, I completely agree with this completely. Uh, this is a terrible... Like, it'd be like reading, you know, like Hitler's Mein Kampf and coming away from it and going, yes, like, this is really good stuff and we should all listen to it but having a complex response to it. And I think that the world needs complex responses. That's the thing. The world needs complex responses. Our social media is filled with oversimplified, reductive responses to some of the most complex issues our species faces today. We need more okay but. So, three positions, but I think it's the mix of them that's best.